So let's see. Um, I want to finish up the ionization of hydrogen, um, and uh, and then um, say th say something about uh, the kind of electromagnetic quantized electromagnetic field that's generated by a classical current, and um, then uh, well maybe I'll do that third in third place. In second place, I want to um, describe or, or summarize uh, something that we learned about um, emission and absorption of light by atoms. And then, um, and that will lead us, that will give us a derivation of uh, the Bose-Einstein uh, curve. Um, and uh, and then um, that, by the way, is the curve that's um, observed in the background radiation, uh, cosmic microwave background radiation. And then um, uh, after that, uh, I want to discuss um, the scattering of a photon by an atom and. Um, uh, I don't think we're going to get through that, but um, we can, I can say a few words about it. Okay, so that's the plan. Um, let me find my notes here on the uh, ionization of hydrogen. Let me just make sure I've got that are, are you able to model, like, say again? Are you able to model, like, molecular? Not atomic hydrogen, but like hydrogen gas. You know, oh, you mean molecular hydrogen? Yeah, molecular hydrogen. Uh, gosh, I mean, this is not... The ionization energy changes a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I, I imagine so. I'm just discussing atomic hydrogen. I have to think in order to generalize it to molecular hydrogen. Um, so what's the story? Out in space, there are regions of just atomic hydrogen, aren't there? But are those already ionized, or, or is it? I don't really know. Yes. <coughs> okay. Well, um, I want to uh, I want to go through this um, ionization thing uh, somewhat quickly because we've already talked about it a couple of times and we just didn't um, have enough time to finish. Um, this matrix element um, is minus i over h bar and equals zero to t. Um, as usual, the, the, the uh, free Hamiltonians on both sides pull out the energies and uh, what we have is e to the i um, ep uh, minus e let me just say g so that's ground state uh, minus h bar omega t prime over h bar t prime and all that multiplies the matrix element which is minus Q over M um, P P dot epsilon and um, uh, simply A and uh, one zero zero K. Okay. Um, uh, B equal sign. And um, so altogether, that's um, I Q over H bar M. The matrix element gives us just, um, after all, we just had an annihilation operator here. There's only one photon. So we just get uh, P dot epsilon. And then, we have the, uh, and then we have that square root of H bar over 2. We get this you know, epsilon Z. Um, and 
Finally, we have P, E-T-I, P.X-1-0-0. We've got the K, and the time integral here is E-T-I. Let me just call it delta E-T minus 1 over delta E. But when we do that, we cancel the I over H bar. So this is our expression. What's this matrix element? Well, P, E-T-I, K, X, 1, 0, 0. I might have had, I might have missed, I think I missed a factor of 2 in this because I was converting from, well, I was trying to do it really on the fly. Although I had noticed what they were doing on other units. So it's 4 squared of pi over B, Z over A0 to the 3 halves, 2 Z A0 cubed over Z squared plus, and I'm calling this S squared A0 squared squared. And S here, I'm taking to be the initial photon wave vector minus the wave vector of the emitted electron. So, that's what happened. You remember we insert a complete set of states, and I think I went through this part last time. I think it was a factor of 2 missing. In any event, when we put this together, what we get is P, S, T0, 1, 0, 0, K squared is 4 Q squared over M squared sine squared of delta E T over 2 H bar divided by delta E squared and then times the matrix element. Oh, gosh, I'm almost going backwards here because I've gotten back to P dot A, 1, 0, 0, K squared. So that's sort of going backwards. Let me say, you know, this turns into a delta function. So this is 4 Q squared over M squared. The matrix element P, P dot A, 1, 0, 0, K squared delta of delta E times pi T over 2 H bar. And altogether, when we put these things together, we get that the rate apart from final states is Q squared pi over M squared H bar, H bar over epsilon 0 B omega K, P dot epsilon R of K squared, 16 pi over V, Z over A0 cubed, 4 Z squared, A0 to the 6 over Z squared plus, this is S squared, A0 squared. And then finally, this delta of delta E, which you remember is E P minus E G minus H bar omega K. So that's that expression. And of course, E P is P squared over 2 M. So D E of P is P over M, D P, sorry. P over M, D P. And the sum over these final states 
has to be, it has to be, it's not simply B over 2 pi H bar cubed D cubed P, but there's a factor of 2 here because the final electron can have two possible spin states, and we're not measuring them, we're just summing over them. And so this is 2B P squared D P D omega over 2 pi H bar cubed and so the total rate is 2B over 2 pi H bar cubed integral P squared D P D omega W hat, which is 2B M over 2 pi H bar cubed integral P D E of P D omega W hat. Well, the D E, the reason for going to D E of P is that then you can do the delta function without worrying about the scaling factor. And when you put all this together, what you get is 32 Q squared pi squared P P dot epsilon R of K squared divided by M 2 pi H bar, that's a cube. Cubed epsilon 0 P omega K D over E 0 cubed 4 Z squared A 0 is the bore radius to the 6 Z squared plus S squared A 0 squared to the 4 and then D omega. Okay. Any questions? I still have trouble. I'm running very low on clock. I mean, not for today. If I get three questions, I can survive today. I remember to bring the cracker. Okay, so this is the expression. And as I mentioned to you last time, well, there are two possibilities. One possibility is that we have an unpolarized beam of photons. And if we have an unpolarized beam of photons, then what we have to do is we have to average this sum. So we average the sum over R of P dot epsilon R of K squared. And so this is one half P I need a sum sign. Sum R equals 1 to 2 P dot epsilon R of K epsilon R dagger of K dot P. So that makes that thing into a matrix. And if you now maybe I should do this more explicitly. Let me do this more explicitly for you just in case people have a hard time with this. This is saying P I epsilon R I epsilon R J star P J. So it's it's the it's this guy is sort of a row vector here. This thing is a matrix and this guy is a column vector. And this matrix is the outer product matrix. And the way you do such an outer product matrix is you just take the vector 
uh, like that, epsilon i, and then the vector epsilon j star like that, and then you multiply all the elements of this column times all the elements of this row, and you just make a matrix that's three by three. Okay. So that's how that works. And that particular matrix is the it's 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 the identity operator minus the projection operator on the vector k because the polarization vectors have to be orthogonal to k. So this particular matrix in here, in other words, we get down to here, one half sum epsilon r of k dot p squared then is one half, and now let me just sort of look at notes, p on the left, the matrix is i minus k hat, k hat transpose p, and um, that is equal to one half p squared minus p dot k squared, which is one half p squared times one minus cosine squared theta. And here, um, the angle between p and k is um, cosine theta. Um, 
what we get is 8z to the 5th, a0, q, 4, 5, epsilon, 0, alpha, h, bar, c, over m, pi, h, bar, q, c, epsilon, 0, omega, k, p, q, sine squared theta over z squared plus s squared, b0 squared, 4. By the way, all these occurrences of h, bar, and c, not to mention epsilon, 0, and occasionally u, 0, are what prompted Feynman, in particular, to, I don't know if he invented natural humans, but he certainly promoted them. And when you're in natural units, you just have h, bar, and c to the 1. And so then the formulas become a lot easier to write down. And also, you make fewer mistakes, because if you've got to keep track of the h, bars, and the c's, and the epsilon, 0's, and so forth, then that means that you're liable to lose track of the 2's and the pi's. And the 2's and the pi's are really important. In any event, this thing here boils down. So let's see. Maybe I should skip some of these steps and boil it down for you. All right, I'm going to really boil it down. I'm skipping quite a few steps in the notes. We're down to 16 p cubed alpha. Oh, wait a minute. I don't want to go that far. There's actually an intermediate step here. 32. The energy of the final photon, final electron, the eject electron, divided by its rest energy, mc squared. So that's a small number. cp, which is sort of the, this would be the energy of the ejected electron if it were relativistic. But it isn't. But it's still sort of a mix. It's something, the units of energy, divided by the energy of the incoming photon. And then mc alpha over h bar. And actually, I should have used a nicer way of writing that. But I don't want to try to use this one. So let me just go this way. a0 to the fifth sine squared theta over this big structure here. Let me see. Maybe I, yeah, let me back up one step. Because I think this, maybe this is not fair. Yeah, let me go down one step. Oh, no, I think I'll stick with this step. z to the fifth, a0 to the fifth. And then s squared plus z squared over a0 squared. OK, well, yeah, actually, the step a little bit before that was actually slightly better. So I'm going to write it down in this form also. So another way of writing it is d sigma d omega is 32 a0 squared, which is this ball radius squared, z to the fifth, ep over mc squared, cp over h bar omega k, sine squared theta over z squared plus s squared a0 squared to the fourth. I think this is actually the nicest way of writing it. Because it tells you that 
the cross section here is roughly the this, this area of four radius squared, and then it's reduced by several factors. It's enhanced by z to the fifth. Remember, we decided it was so cheap we just do it for an arbitrary charge on the nucleus. The energy of the ejected electron divided by its stress energy. The uh, momentum of the emitted electron divided by, or not the momentum, the, the so to speak relativistic energy of the, uh, it's not really that either. But anyway, CP over H bar omega K, and then a geometrical factor sine squared theta. And then this is a good expression when S is not too big. Um, uh, because it gives us z squared plus s squared a zero, to the, a zero squared to the fourth. Um, in the other limit, when you're going to large s, then you want the s squared out there. And then in that limit, um, in other words, for higher energy initial photons, remember s is, um, where did I write it down? It's k minus q over H bar, uh, K, K minus P over H bar. Well, that's what it is. K minus Q, P over H bar. I don't see where I wrote it down. So in that uh, higher energy limit, then the expression is 32 this ratio, that ratio, this structure, and then um, all these terms. Um, I don't know. Anyway. That's uh, how it could be humbles. Um, probably the simplest way of writing it is 16 pq alpha over m h bar squared omega k z to the fifth sine squared theta over m zero to the fifth s squared plus z squared over z to the fifth. Anyway, it's all in the notes and they're online. Now, this was what we averaged over the, uh, the polarization of the uh, initial photon. Suppose the photon beam is polarized. And uh, let's suppose that the polarization vector is epsilon 1, which we choose to lie, uh, to lie in the point in the x direction. Okay? So if, if the initial photon is polarized in the x direction, then we have to substitute p squared over 2 sine squared theta has to be replaced by p dot epsilon r of k squared. And um, so that means that uh, p sigma d omega is um, 32 p dot epsilon r of k squared p alpha z to the fifth over m h bar squared omega k a zero to the fifth s squared plus z squared over a zero squared to the fourth. So that's that's that expression. And now let's compute what this polarization what e dot p is. Um, in, so with these coordinates over here, we can see that epsilon is pointing this way, p is pointing that way. So what we're asking for is simply the x component of the momentum p. And um, so p dot epsilon r of k squared then is p squared sine squared theta cosine squared p. And so now we have d sigma d omega is uh, 32 over m pq alpha over h bar squared omega k a zero to the fifth sine squared theta cosine squared p over s squared plus z squared over z zero squared to the fourth power. And remember, S squared is equal to K minus P over H bar squared. So that's K squared plus P squared over H bar squared 
minus 2 P dot K over H bar. And so that is K squared plus P squared over H bar squared minus 2 P K over H bar cosine theta. So there's a cosine theta dependence in there. And that cosine theta dependence, I guess we can see that it's raised to the fourth power. So at higher energies, this can be, when K and P get pretty big, then this can overwhelm that. And that would mean that when cosine theta is 1, which is the forward direction, so it's P in the forward direction. All right, so that's enough of that. Of course, being P in the forward direction is what you'd expect physically if you didn't know anything about physics. You'd expect that if a photon of pretty high energy slams into a hydrogen atom, you'd expect that the electron, the ejected electron, would go out more or less in the direction of the initial photon. And that's what this thing is telling us. Apart from the polarization, let's just check the polarization for a moment. It's saying that the polarization goes with cosine phi. And so that means that it's biggest when phi is equal to zero. So in other words, the peaking isn't, if the photon is polarized, the peaking isn't really that much in the forward direction because you want it to be in the XZ plane. So the peaking would somewhere be out like that rather than strictly forward. And there's also, of course, this sine squared theta in the numerator. So that has the peaking in the opposite direction. That has the peaking out in the side direction. And that's dominant at low energies. At low energies, the photon, the ejected electron for unpolarized incident photons are basically in the XY plane. And the reason for that is that the electric field of the photon is perpendicular to its direction of motion. So the electron is kicked out to the side. OK. All right. Let me, are there any questions? Because we're going to switch now to something else. All right. So let me do some erasing here. OK. Well, let's just recall our formulas for a general process. And let me talk about this process in a sort of, let's imagine that we have n photons of momentum k and wave number k and polarization r. And we have two atomic states, a and b. And we're talking about equilibrium here. a goes to b plus a photon. All right. So the first process is b n plus 1 s of t0 a n. And this, as you know, it's going to be, and I'm working here in lowest order, minus i over h bar 
integral 0 to t is uh, b n plus 1 minus q over m p dot a a n e to the i delta b t prime over h bar p t prime. And so this gives us um, i q over h bar m uh, this factor which is h bar over 2 epsilon 0 v omega k to the 1 half and then we have um, p n plus 1 we have p dot epsilon um, uh, this is going to be an annihilation operator a sub r of k ubi k dot x a n ubi delta e t prime over h bar t prime my gradients on l um, and so this is i q over h bar m this square root, which you've seen so many times now. Now, the annihilation operator on the state n gives us a square root of n sub r of k. We're left with a matrix element. Oh, I'm sorry. This, what did I this time? A sub n goes to n plus 1. We need a creation operator. And so this is, so a dagger on n is square root of n sub r of k plus 1 times b. And then everything cancels, and we get b, um, so p dot epsilon e to the minus i k dot x a. And uh, then an integral, 0 to t, e to the i delta e, t prime over h prime, t prime. Okay. So that's, um, that's the process for, um, for the process uh, a goes to b plus down. And we can even think of this very generally. We can imagine A as being any old atom. It doesn't have to be hydrogen. And in that case, this B, we then have a sum over all the electrons. So it's P sub I, E to the I, K dot, uh, um, what is this? It's just X I. I guess it must be. Um, right. Okay, so that's the expression. Now we want to compare that with the uh, the other process. And um, let me tell you, if you're doing this um, by yourself someday without a book, keep in mind that the initial state has n photons. Okay. So in a certain sense, this is a little bit misleading. So what we're going to be computing over here is a n minus one s p zero b n. So in both initial both initial states we have n photons. All right. Well. This is going to be um, this is going to be very similar to that. It's going to be minus i over h bar. Uh, 
this big square root, well, let's see, maybe I should go a little bit more slowly, minus i over h bar integral 0 to t to t prime, you're going to have an e to the i delta e t prime over h bar. And in each case, this delta e is going to be, maybe I should write down what delta e is here. Delta e here is um, e b minus e a, and um, it's it's e b e b plus um, h bar omega k because there's an extra proton over there. Over here, delta e is going to be e a. Uh, minus E B, and now there's an extra photon over here, so it's minus H bar omega K. And um, so you see, this delta E is just minus that delta E. And so that's not going to have any effect on it. And then the matrix element here is A N minus 1. Um, sum over i pi dot epsilon r of k a r of k pi k dot xi p n Now the annihilation operator on an n photon state brings out a square root of n. And so this thing, this thing, I want to sort of write it in the same way. So this thing is IQ over H bar M, this factor here, H bar over 2 epsilon 0 B omega K to the 1 half. And then this will be square root of n sub r of k. And then it will be integral 0 to t. Um, well, let's see. Wait a minute. I, 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 even, I left out the matrix on. Let me put the matrix on again. Because that's important. What's left is a sum on i pi dot epsilon r of k um, pi k dot xi e. And now integral 0 to t, t e i delta e, t prime over h bar, t t prime. Okay. Okay. Now, these two things, you see, are very similar. They have the same square roots. They have the same overall factors. They have slightly different square roots of ends. They have a matrix element that's apparently different. And then they have time integrals. One is a complex conjugate of the other. Because this delta is minus that delta. OK. So it's obvious that they're almost the same apart from complex conjugation and so forth. And then the square roots. Let's look at this matrix element and see how far apart they are. Well, B times sum on I, so I'm doing this one, PI dot epsilon, let's see, did I get this right as a star here? Epsilon star E to the minus I K dot XI. Um, is that original? Yes. A. Okay. What is that? Well, that is A P I dot epsilon E I K dot X I B complex conjugate. Okay, so the complex conjugate of the matrix element, you switch the bras and kets, and you put the adjoint to the operator in here. It just flips it around exactly the way we want. 
And this, of course, is the complex conjugate of the matrix element up here. So what we've got is that um, the absolute value, in other words, of the transition uh, rate, that is to say, or this, 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 let me just say, B n plus 1 S T0 A n is equal to square root of n plus 1 over square root of n times the absolute value of a n minus 1 s t 0 b n absolute value. So that's, um, let me get a drink and then come back. So that's what we have. All right, now let's impose these conditions of equilibrium. We're imagining that we have these atoms and photons, and everything's in equilibrium, so we have a certain density of atoms in state A, a certain certain number of atoms, I should or density of atoms in state A and in state B, a certain number of photons in uh, uh, momentum K and uh, polarization R, and it's that certain number which which is the reason why we have as the initial state N photons in both cases. Um, so what is N of the number of atoms in state B over the number of atoms in state A? Well, we expect this to be the Boltzmann distribution e to the minus e b over k t divided by e to the minus e a over k t. And um, this is then e to the um, e a minus e b over k t. Now, what is e a minus e b? Well, delta E is enforced to be zero in these things, so E A minus E B is H bar omega K. So this ratio is E to the H bar omega over K T. So that's N B over N A. On the other hand, the equilibrium says that N of B times W absorption should be N of A times W emission. And so that, now we've seen that these two, now the, the, the rates are caused, are these things squared? And um, this one is absorption. No, that's emission. And this is absorption. So what we have is NB over NA is W emission over W absorption. Now if we look at it, W emission over W absorption then is N plus 1 over N. Good. On the other hand, NB over NA is e to the h bar omega over kt. And so now we have a, an exercise in high school algebra. n plus 1 is n, and just to make it easy, I'm just going to call this e. And so that means then that uh, 1 is equal to n times e minus 1. And that means n is equal to 1 over e minus 1, or translating back into correct units, e to the h bar omega 
over KT minus 1. So this is what N sub R of K is. So what we've derived then is the mean plane. Anyway, the plane distribution. And of course, these photons that have been so important in the last 40 or 50 years of cosmology, these were the photons that were around when the universe became transparent, something like 300,000 years after the last period of high temperature, which is called the Big Bang. And so then with the red shift, they've gone from the temperature, the distribution for a temperature of maybe 10,000 degrees down to, they've red shifted down to something like 3 degrees Kelvin, 2.7. I don't know if this measures very accurately. Okay. The, you can, since we've gone this far, we might as well go the rest of the distance. The energy of the radiation field per unit volumes in an angular frequency, T omega, is 1 over L cubed. That's the per unit volume. Then we're going to have H bar omega. That's the energy. This is the weight over E to the H bar omega over KT minus 1. There are two polarization states. That's two. Then remember we have L cubed over, L over P pi cubed gives us this, this going from box quantization to continuum quantization. And then 4 pi K squared DK. All of that, if you put it together, is H pi H bar over C cubed omega over 2 pi cubed 1 over E to the H bar omega over KT minus 1 T omega. Or writing in new units, which is U of omega T omega T nu. It's H pi Planck's constant nu cubed over C cubed. And again, 1 over E to the H. That's not H bar. It's H. H nu over KT minus 1. Okay. So that's, that's the derivation of all of that. Any questions? Let me erase some of this and talk about the radiation from charge. Radiation caused by the C number current. In other words, real radiation, of course, is caused by electrons, well, any charged particle. And those charged particles described by a quantum field, and I suppose we'll have time to say what that is. In fact, I think that will be the next topic after the scattering. Rayleigh and Thompson scattering. After doing that, I think we'll switch to the quantized field. Anyway, as you know, this S of T0, this S operator, is a time-ordered product of E to the minus I over H bar integral 0 to T 
the interaction Hamiltonian, which is something like the T prime, the interaction Hamiltonian, which is in our units, actually I do not have time to change the units here. So what I might do, if you just give me a break here, I'm going to write this as gamma, where gamma is a universal units conversion factor. So you pick your units and you stick in the right gamma. I'm going to do that for the moment. I think it's just simply one for a time, but it might involve a new zero. Okay, so that's our expression. And so in other words, canceling these two, we just have a, we just have the expression like that. And now, throughout all the processes that we've been discussing here so far, we've been able to get away with first order perturbation theory, because we're talking about the absorption of one photon or the emission of one photon. And so we could take the E of the I, H zero, T prime over H bar, and instead of applying them to the operators in here, we can apply them to the final states, which are eigenstates of H zero. Here we can't do that. And so what we're imagining is that this is a prescribed current, prescribed current. It's a C number current. And this is the quantized electromagnetic field, but what we're talking about here is the A of X and T is E to the I, H zero field T over H bar. So actually this is a T prime. But let me leave the prime off here. A of X and zero, E to the minus I, H zero field T over H bar. And what that means is that this field is the sum of polarizations and wave vectors, H bar over two epsilon zero V omega K to the one half, epsilon R of K, A sub R of K. And now it's E to the I, K dot X minus omega K T. Plus epsilon R star of K, A sub R adjoint of K, E to the minus I, K dot X minus omega K T. All right, so that's what this field is here. It's this thing. The T dependence, it means that the operators have, I don't think that's A, B, H1, N1. I think it's an allergy stage. Let's hope. Anyway, so this is our expression here. Now, there's an identity which is important, very important in quantum optics. E to the A, E to the B is E to the A plus B plus a half the commutator of A with B. And this holds if, this isn't universal, this holds if A, A, B equals zero and B, A, B equals zero. Otherwise, there's an infinite series here in the next one. Okay, what does that mean? Well, up here, you see we've got the time order of these things. So this is not simply an exponential. It's a product. Oh, hey, I left something out. And this is D, Q, X, of course. This isn't a field at one point. It's integrated over space. 
So it's the current density dotted into the electromagnetic field integrated over space. All right. So, and in fact, if we're talking about the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, this would be integral minus infinity to plus infinity. d cubed x, this would be integral over all of space time. I over h bar j dot a with gamma for the uh, arbitrary units. Okay, so what happens when you um, when you do these things? Well, you can take the e to the j dot a at one time. Let me just say uh, x t plus dt times dt, and of course integrated d cubed x. Now there is time order product. I'm just sort of writing it down. I over h bar is this. It's an infinite product, an ordered product of, of things that look like this. I over h bar integral d cubed x j of x t dot a x t dt. So the difference between here and here is that we move forward one time slice dt. So this is the same as that. Okay. This is e to the a, and this is e to the b. The product of them is e to the a plus b plus a half the commutator. So this, in other words, is equal to e to the i over h bar integral d cubed x. Um, and now it's j dot a x t plus j dot a of x t plus d t all that times d t. It's the product of that plus, plus something else, namely one half the commutator and now this will be integral, this will be integral d cubed x d cubed x prime dt dt prime uh, j j prime yeah. a of x t uh, a of x prime t plus dt the commutator but the commutator of a of t with a of t prime just involves commutators of a linear combination of a and a dagger with another linear combination of a and a dagger. And there you either get zero or you get a constant. In any event, you get something that commute, you get a commutator that commutes with a and b, a and b being just the electromagnetic field times j. So in other words, the upshot is that this whole integral here can be written as, well, I'm going to try to write it here so I don't have to kneel down so I can do it. It can be written as e to the i over h bar integral d cubed x integral 0 to t to t prime j of x and t prime dot a of x and t prime plus a phase factor i phi and the I phi is a complicated phase factor, and it's, uh, I think it's something that Glauber worked out. He published this in PhysRev 84, number 3, page 395, and the year is 19. 51. Using these to prevent studying it. And so, um, in other words, the 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 S operator for prescribed current is the integral of J dot A plus the phase. 
in the face is not physically important. And of course, I looked down at my camera. The human torture units. Um, now, one might not be impressed by this at first glance. It may look as though, well, we've taken something that was horribly complicated and we used it to something that's merely complicated. But in fact, you, you guys have studied the coherent states at some point? Did, did Dunlap talk about coherent states in Lab 21? Harmonic oscillated coherent states? I'm not sure. All right. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, it turns out that this operator here, a linear, it's a, this operator, if we look at it abstractly, it's an exponential of a combination, linear combination of A and A dagger, a complex linear combination of A and A dagger, and in fact, it's also a unitary operator. It's unitary because J is real, A is permission, and I is imaginary. I H bar gamma is imaginary. So this is a unitary operator. If you have an operator that is unitary and it's an exponential and a linear combination of A and A dagger, that's called a displacement operator. And for each mode, it looks like this. E to the alpha A dagger minus alpha star A. That's what, that's what this looks like. Because it's a linear combination of A and A dagger. Of course, it's summed over all, it's summed over all modes and polarizations. So that's what you've got. But when that is applied to the vacuum, what you get is a coherent state. So let me call this, um, I'll just, I'll, I'll use K, I'm suppressing the polarization index. So this turns out to be alpha, uh, oh, I can write it, alpha sub R of K. This is, a co this is what's called a coherent state. And it has the remarkable property that A sub R of K on this coherent state alpha sub R of K is equal to alpha sub R of K times this state alpha sub R of K. In other words, this, the coherent state is an eigenstate of every annihilation operator with a complex eigenvalue. And so maybe I'll put, maybe I'll make this a um, something related to this homework problem. Any questions about this? I should add one word of caution. One word of caution. Well, maybe one paragraph of caution. In the real world, um, that is to say, uh, as perceived by humans at normal temperature and pressure and so forth and so on, the electromagnetic field is essentially classical and, well, actually, in fact, that's not really true, but um, the electromagnetic field that one can make from simple objects like an antenna running the current up and down an antenna and so forth, the, the, that sort of world um, is essentially classical and um, can, in fact, the black body world is in a certain sense essentially classical. That is to say, there are trillions of photons 
in any macroscopic signal more than trillions, I mean you know, hundreds of trillions of the national debt in pennies. And, um, and uh, each of them uh, has a wavelength that's of the order of uh, you know, 500 nanometers or so. Um, on the other hand, and, and so the, the electromagnetic field very often is almost classical. On the other hand, the, the world of, um, well, I guess, I, I guess in this world, the current that's going up and down the um, antenna is also essentially classical. Um, but there are many things that happen in our real world in which the, 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 uh, the electrons are individual electrons going around the individual nuclei. And so there the quantum aspect is, is more, more apparent than, um, certainly more apparent than the field aspect. Um, in any event, um, the bottom line is that if you, if you make the current classical, keep the electromagnetic field quantized, compute the exact S operator, it is a displacement operator, which means that classical current, classical electric currents generate coherent states, which are eigenstates of the um, annihilation operators. And moreover, these states are the most classical states of the electromagnetic field. So in other words, um, the states that look most classical are the coherent states. And that sort of makes sense because if you have a, a an electric current that is that is completely classical, you expect that the corresponding electromagnetic field would be as classical as possible. And in fact it is, that's the coherent state. That's not the Any questions? Alright, why don't you cancel it and end it or something?